Greetings. As you probably know, policing, the injustice in the criminal justice system, and the prison industrial complex all together provide numerous gateways for African descended people in the United States to enter into slavery. And even with this reality before us, we still desire to experience freedom throughout our lives. So how can we feel free? How can we experience freedom on a vast scale? When there's a likelihood that many of us who've never been incarcerated will one day be imprisoned and be enslaved. These are some difficult questions to ponder and contemplate. But we have an extraordinary Dharma teacher who has contributed a talk for the Black and Buddhist Summit. His name is Jarvis J. Masters. Jarvis J. Masters has been on death row in San Quentin for decades. Yet, he's written this book, Finding Freedom, How Death Row Broke and Opened My Heart. To write a book from death row about how Buddhism helped him learn to cry, learn to care, learn to submit himself to a meditation master is all an act of love. And so I'd like to read a portion of his book to you. And then you're going to be in the position to receive his profound teachings through a pre recorded interview. But first, an excerpt from his book. This is on page 90. For a long time, I had been my own stranger, but everything I went through in learning how to accept myself brought me to the doorsteps of Dharma, the Buddhist path. During my death penalty trial, Melody, a private investigator working on my case, sent me books on how to meditate, how to deal with pain and suffering, how to keep my mind at rest. She had broken her ankle and was trying to keep still. She and I were both trying this meditation gig and like me, she was confronting a lot of things in her past. She was also writing and encouraged me to do so as well. I began to get up early to try to calm my mind so I wouldn't panic. It was as if my whole life was being displayed on a screen during the death penalty case. Things I had never realized about myself and my life were introduced to me and the jury at the same time. Questions I'd never asked my mother, like how long she'd been abused on the street, an addict, were being asked now. Through meditation, I learned to slow down and take a few deep breaths, to take everything in, not to run from the pain, but to sit with it, confront it, give it the companion it had never had. I became committed to my meditation practice. While I was in the holding booth during the jury's deliberation on whether I should get life without parole or the death penalty, I started leafing through a Buddhist journal Melody had left there. It was an article called Life 
in relation to death by a Tibetan Buddhist Lama, Chogdud Tolku Rinpoche. I thought, wow, this is right up my alley. I sent a letter to the address in the journal and got a reply from a woman named Lisa, one of Rinpoche's close students, with a copy of his booklet, Life in Relation to Death. At the time, I'd gotten into some kind of trouble and was in isolated confinement, stripped down to a pair of shorts and a t-shirt with only two blankets. In her letter, Lisa asked if I needed help. I always needed help. I still need help. And because of the help she offered, we began corresponding. Then she began to visit me and eventually brought Rinpoche to San Quentin. When I first saw Rinpoche through the glass in the small visiting room booth, I thought, oh shit, I'm in trouble now. I'm messing around with a real llama. He's from Tibet. Check him out. I bet everything he's got on is blessed. <laughs> I figured there were two ways I could introduce myself. I could greet him in an ordinary way, or I could bow. I bowed. Then he bowed. Why'd I think he wouldn't? He's been bowing all his life. I thought, I've been reading about llamas for the last three years, and now I have a real one in front of me. I knew that all I could do was tell him exactly what I think. If I lied or shied away from him, he'd know it. I fell in love with him for the same reasons everybody else does. His life history was my key. He had been a rebellious kid. He wasn't born with a silver spoon. He was a feisty guy who would discipline me when I needed it. He knew what he was talking about and would say it in a way that I'd get it. He had a certain shrewdness, compassionate ferociousness, he was a llama who ate beef jerky, got upset, and had jewels of compassion in him. The only thing he didn't do was say all this to me. I just felt it. I thought, here's a guy who can take me out of prison even as I remain here. He won't dress me in Buddhist garb, but accept me as I am. I knew he was a tough character. Long time, San Quentin, death row inmate, Jarvis J. Masters. Author of Finding Freedom. Offers us wisdom from his vantage point of being a black Buddhist man imprisoned on death row. What you're about to hear is a pre-recorded interview specifically for the Black and Buddhist Summit permitted by San Quentin, J. Jarvis Masters, talking directly or indirectly to us. He is, record, he is uh, interviewed by two-time Emmy award-winning producer podcast host, Corny Cool. Oh, her podcast is called Dear Governor. Please listen very, very carefully to Jarvis J. Masters. <laughs> you know, it's funny, that last name Masters, it's like, yeah, dude, you're a master. You're a master, you're a master. Listen carefully as he recounts parts of his life, his observations about being in prison, contemplations on dying, his decision to be free while on death row, and listen to how he expresses his heart of compassion for his fellow prisoners. At the end of the interview, J. Jarvis Masters makes a request and the AWAKE Network intends to fulfill 
that request. Thank you. I am Jarvis Masters. I've been in San Quentin for close to 40 years, a few months short of that. I became a Buddhist in 1991, I think, or 92. I've written two books, one, Finding Freedom, and the other is That Bird Has My Wings. I have various teachers, and all my teachers have given me the benefit of their experience in the last 30 years, and I've been using those experiences in prison as much as they fit the circumstances that we live in. How did you get introduced to Buddhism back in 91 or 90? How did you find it? I was waiting to see if I was going to receive a death sentence for the death of a sergeant, Sergeant Bursfield at San Quentin, that occurred in 1985. And my friend and, and teacher, one of my teachers, uh, Melody Armerchild, thought because I was down there in the holding tank that I might want to read a magazine that was familiar to her, and it was called Inquiry Mind. And inside Inquiry Mind, they had this little clip, and it said free book, and the name of the book was Life in Relationship to Death, and I sat there and read it for almost a week while my why the jury's in deliberation, and I just thought, hey, you know, let me try this. You know, Life in Relationship to Death, you know, it was where I was, you know. I wasn't there because because of my trial. I was there. Be, I, I realized the na- that name because of my whole life history. And I took heart to that, and eventually I got a free copy of the book, and I wrote to thank them. And a woman named Lisa Leghorn uh, responded, and we created a correspondence. And at some point I realized she was a senior student of who is now my teacher, Tuku Repache, and eventually he, you know, he came down to visit me uh, a few times, and at some point I was given the empowerment. It's a ceremony that was just basically to introduce me to Vajrayana Buddhism, and I became a student of that practice, and I was given a practice called the Red Tar Practice, And I thought that practice, as I began to sit with it, was a very clear, honest way of opening me up to see where freedom really is. What is the Red Tower practice? Red Tower practice is a guide, a way of opening the door of confronting our suffering, the suffering of all beings, and it's a prayer that allows us to you know, work on that, work on opening many, many doors that has been locked. They were locked for me particularly because there was a lot of things I was in denial. There was a lot of things that I didn't pay attention to that my life gave some purpose for. And I really, really got into it. I I thought it as a, a, a perfect guide for where I was going in my life. Why? What What now, was it about Buddhism in particular that that drew you in? Oh, it was the opening gate. It opened a lot of doors. It opened a lot of gates for me to sit with. It was a practice that had meditation, a lot of meditation. It was a practice that that dealt with me and the suffering that I was dealing with, you know, the human suffering that I was dealing with. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And it taught me how to begin the process of dissolving those those things, those obstacles that has been in my life. What Every, was that like, know, Jarvis? Like when you first meditated? So you're you're sitting there and you're waiting to hear the verdict back on the death sentence. Walk us through your experience with meditation. Was it frustrating at first? Did you take to it like a fish to water? No, I just I just learned how to sit down and 
and do probably the opposite. I just sat down and start thinking. That was a good thing for me because I had to learn how to sit down first before I learned how to meditate. I was a very angry person, and I didn't particularly think sitting down was, you know, fulfilling for me at that time. So I just had to learn how to sit down and, and sit down with me, you know, and mm -hmm. that took a while. You know, there was a lot of times where I was bored with it, but I made a commitment to myself to just sit there. And things start opening up. Gates start opening up. Windows start becoming with more fresh air than I had ever felt before. Mm. And that was a beautiful time for me. It really was. And I was dealing with San Quentin, and I was dealing with death row, and I was dealing with how did I get to this point in my life. And I start realizing that we all suffer to some degree or another and that I was not alone. And one of the things my teacher, one of my teachers taught me was that, you know, you're not the worst case, you know. Uh, there's many people who have far more worse problems than you. And that was a that was a guiding light for me to not think of me for me, but just think of all beings and all people who suffer way more than I do. And I really felt a companionship with that, you know. Was it difficult at first? I mean, did you have any resentment? Because to tell you that there are people worse off than you, here you are potentially on death row, how did that sit with you? I learned Buddhism pretty much at the feet of my teacher. So mm. I was really, really guided. Very, I was very trained. I, I had the benefit of really, really having a sangha, a, a community, and I had members of that community visit me often. So I never went outside what I was trained to sit with. Was it difficult? I think it was not in, in, in retrospect. Was it mm. boring? Of course that was, yes, it was boring, at, very boring. <laughs> For me, I just had the benefit of having teachers all around me. My age, older than me, folks who've been into Buddhism 20 years before I had. And these people really, really trained, trained me, taught me a lot. But more than that, they taught me how to teach myself. Mm -hmm. And that was something I never really, really had the ability to learn how to teach myself. You can find all kinds of teachers, you know, and all kinds of teachers want you to think like they do or practice like they do. And my community taught me how to think for myself, taught me how to become my own practitioner because mm -hmm. they recognized that I was on San Quentin's death row. And for many of them, they couldn't even fathom the thought of being physically on death row. Mm -hmm. So for them, they thought, wow, he's really... He really is suffering. He is in that sea of suffering. He is facing death, real death. And they made me realize that, but they also made me realize that that is nothing close to being the end of who I was. You know, it was the beginning of who I became. Um, I, I just had the opportunity to have some serious people around me. So you learned, the first step was to learn to sit with yourself. Can you describe what that looked like? I assume you sat in your 9 by 4 cell and just sat on the ground? Yeah, I just sat on the ground. I mean, I didn't want to sit on no cushion. I wanted to sit on the ground because I really wanted to feel what my body was going through. You know, I really wanted to feel that sense of suffering. I didn't want to make this place comfortable. And I was determined not to do that. I was determined not to hide behind, you know, a, being a Buddhist and having a Buddhist community as my way of getting through all the doors that I needed to. At what point did sitting with yourself evolve into a meditation practice, and what did that look like? Well, I thought I thought one of the reasons, and this is in retrospect, because this happened, you know, 30 years ago. So um, I think I was trying to ground out the noise 
that became my my sense of refuge. I was really trying to ground out the noise because San Quentin is a very, very, very loud place. So I was trying to ground out the noise, and a lot of things came to mind that one practitioner or another or friend had said to me, and I sat with that, you know, just out of curiosity, you know. And then I started getting some guidance about meditation, you know, and those particular instructions. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. A lot. You have 60 seconds remaining. Oh, uh, excuse me. A lot of them did not fit San Quentin. So I had to figure out a way to make my practice fit the conditions that I was living in. Mm -hmm. And that gave me a lot of room to explore, to come with a genuine heart, but to explore how do you get along with people being a Buddhist? I mean, you being a Buddhist and no one else, you know? Because right. then there was very few Buddhists. So I had to figure out how to do that, you know? And that became sort of like a practice, you know? You can have your meditation practice and you can have your sitting and you can have your instruction. But St. Quentin gave me a new way of thinking about Buddhism. And I figured it You there, Jarvis? Yes. Okay, we're back. So um, before we got so rudely disconnected, you were talking about how San Quentin gave you a new way of thinking about Buddhism. Yeah, it gave me a new way of thinking about Buddhism because I was feeling pressure on one end, the inmates, the, um, the guards, because I had, as I said, was on the crime scene. You know, I the murder death of Sergeant Bursfield happened on San Quentin, and now I'm on San Quentin, and there was a lot of hatred uh, from the guards, and there was a lot of a lot of people thinking that I was running away from being who I was by accepting the idea of using my time to meditate. So I had mm. sort of like wall-to-wall -wall enemies, so to speak. So I had to figure out what was I going to do if I was going to stay with this practice? I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat. It was very, very hard and a difficult process. But one that I thought really, really opened doors for me, opened many doors for me. As an example, for the first two, maybe three years, maybe five years that I became a practitioner, all I was learning from San Quentin is what not to do. I never felt like I was being inspired to learn what to do. What do you mean learning what not to do? Well, I get I see guys yelling and screaming at guards, and I said, wow, this is what I look when I do that, you know. Mm -hmm. I see guards, you know, in a lot of pain and suffering, and I said, wow, this guard may be going home to his son. I would see violence, and I say, wow, you know, uh, how can I participate in compassion? You know, so it was those kind of experiences that I was constantly learning, you mm -hmm. know. And as I figure my way through these things, people start calling me a real serious practitioner. And I never took serious to that. What my whole trip was is to find the gates that was just going to open me up to understanding what compassion and how compassionate works inside a prison system. Mm. Uh, and it was hard. It was hard. It was, it was very hard, you know. I was confronted with a lot of violence. I was in a shoe unit, a security housing unit. and Solitary all, you know, confinement. Yeah, yeah. They, they put long words to it to deny what it is. And a lot of people were in there for serious things, you know, murder, assault, Serious stuff, you know. And one of the things that broke me through, because I keep talking about opening gates and opening doors, was the first story I wrote called Scars. And this is a, if you read Finding Freedom, story about inmates. And I noticed the scars and whips on their back. And I'd never seen those before, but I had my own. 
you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And because they were pumping iron, lifting weights in the middle of this hot sun. They they just stuck out, you know. They they were whips. They were not just scars. They were serious whips. Mm-hmm. And I just had to figure out where did, the hell did you get these things, you know. And they all told me. But what got me more than anything, uh, more than the story was the expression they gave to the story. Mm-hmm. It was like a proud thing to have these scars and whips. It was to say that I did that been there before. And mm-hmm. I realized I had my own. I had my own. And I looked at my my hand where I remember the counselors made us compete while I was a juvenile and they would put a cigarette between our two thumbs and they waited to see who could stay there the longest. I, was, I forgot about that, you know? But then mm-hmm. when I looked around, I started seeing that. I went to my cell and I realized that I had the same thing. This mm-hmm. call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And, you know, when I felt like I had the same thing, I felt an opportunity to write about the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I wrote this story, The Scars. And somehow the inmates the prisoners, the convicts, got a hold of that story. I can't remember if I shared it with them or they just found it somewhere. And at first I said, oh, my God, what the fuck did I do here? Mm -hmm. And I was surprised to realize they all accepted that story as the true story of their life history. Mm -hmm. It was told from someone who had that own history and there's just a spirit, an acceptance to it, you know, by just using certain words and, you know, instead of using abuse and neglect and all these things, there's other words for it, you know. And so I understood that language would be able to give me a whole lot of access to people. And like any other trade or, you know, you know, a welder would learn all the words that tells you how to weld it. I had to figure out what was the voice of San Quentin, that mm-hmm. fro. And that's been a practice for me ever since. It's not just you learn it and you forget about it. It's a, it's a day-to-day practice. You were out on the yard and you saw these guys, and they all had similar scars and similar life stories. You had the language of Buddhism to, to deal with that history. Did did you share that with the guys that were out there? Were there other guys out there that were Buddhist practitioners? Did they look at you like you were strange that you had this? I had never known a Buddhist practitioner on on those yards back then. Mm -hmm. I've known people who would meditate, you know, but I've never knew them take the practitioner acceptance, empowerment, ceremonies, and, you know, the others uh, as a way of, changing their whole life cycle. It was just me jive talking, talking, you know, directly to their scars and directly to all of our egos. And it was something that I looked at and realized I found the permission to write about prison in Buddhism. It was something that I really, really began to realize my purpose. My purpose for being here is to be more of an engaged Buddhist, Mm -hmm. not so much on the academic side, but more so as a practitioner, as someone who's engaged in trying to find the joy and happiness within, you know, each of us, you know, and, you know, family does that. Writing to family, writing to our nephews and our sons and kids was a real experience. And I thought a lot of us didn't realize how fortunate we were. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I need to say this also. I was one of the first people who dealt with me. I dealt with me, and the only way I could have, and this is in retrospect, the only way I could have done what I was doing was I had to learn how to accept it for myself, too. And that was the heart of my practice. That's what I was taught, trained to practice from. And... I had 
years to sit with, you know, and I sit with those years now. You talked about your ego, and when you came into prison, this is five, ten years prior to Sergeant Birchfield being murdered. Right. You admitted to being angry and bitter and frustrated based on the life that you had been handed. How did Buddhism fundamentally change you and how you dealt with your own ego? Um, I remember going to trial and... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. This is just one way. It could have been other ways. What stands out for me, you know, I learned how to cry. You know, I never did oh. that. Wow. I learned how to hear the tears in other people's speech and their language. Someone come up to me and says, my mother just died. But it ain't no thing, you know, I had a lot of years with her. I, you know, no, you didn't, you know, because mm-hmm. you're living with her now. And I was able to learn how to express that and have the respect of telling that, saying that. And then I felt, res- you know what, I felt responsible for all this stuff now. What I was learning was teaching me how to become a serious practitioner without understanding that that's where I was headed. When you started investigating Buddhism and, and the practice of it. Were there resources outside of what Melody Irmachild gave you? I mean, because this was 30 years ago. So was there a Buddhist chaplain there that could help you learn? There was no such thing as a Buddhist teacher in San Quentin. You know, religion in San Quentin, and I think it's probably in other prisons too, is very territorial. Catholicism, Islam, these faiths, you know, are well established, well inside the prison system. Buddhism was like, where is this going? You know, is this a real religion? We're not going to allow you to practice this in a formal setting because it's not, it's, it don't fit the bill of being a real religion. They didn't recognize it. They didn't acknowledge it. They didn't do any of those things. A good example would be when I had my empowerment ceremony, when my teacher, Repuche, came to give me my power and ceremony. They kept me behind a glass window. Mm. All the rituals and all the little things that you would need to go through an empower ceremony mm-hmm. were not given to us. They didn't acknowledge that. But now, if I wanted to get baptized, they escort you right outside the prison, right out the adjustment center, and you'll go be baptized somewhere. But you know what? I did not mind those things. I wasn't smart enough or I didn't take my practice serious enough to see the discrimination in that. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the reasons why I didn't do that is because Repuche didn't give me no excuse. He wouldn't allow no excuse. <laughs> so I didn't. I just gave up on, you know, whatever frustrations I had with that. You're wasting time. You know, his attitude was you're wasting time. How did the guys with you on the East Block take to the fact that you were you like an, a Buddhist elder to them or did they find did they accept you for who you were? They have this saying and I may have interpreted it the wrong way so forgive me if I have but I always heard that term kill the Buddha you know at some point you have to kill the Buddha and I kind of understand it but Maybe I did not understand, but I definitely used it, you know. Mm -hmm. I I definitely put my own twist to it. And what I mean by putting my twist to it was that I stopped trying to act like a Buddhist. The Buddha that I would try to imitate sitting down, Mm -hmm. the one that would, you know, hold his fingers together and try to meditate, (laughs) the one who has some kind of deep, realization, the kind of people who thought they found enlightenment. I stopped being those people. I stopped reading the books. I was left on my own. And I think what my teacher taught me is how to be on my own in a way of bringing a a more number of people in a community together, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was me learning how to not talk like a Buddhist and be a Buddhist, mm. not having all the academic skills, readings to be a Buddhist. I mean, those are pitfalls. All those are what get you in trouble. You know, I was keeping my friendships. That's all. I was trying to keep people from going to the hole or being um, 
um, uh, extracted from their cells or maced or shot or all those things. Has the Buddhist community grown in the last 30 years? Oh, yeah. Oh, Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about oh. it? You know, I think the ministration has most ministrations in our nation's history. You have 60 seconds remaining. Accepted the idea that it helps it helps the overall institution to have or to have someone come in, die to prison, and teach people how to sit and meditate. It's been a benefit to the prison administrations, uh, at least the ones I know, to be able to do that. So it's it's a it's an important aspect of understanding what helps prisons and prisoners find peace, find that inner peace, and they're not assault guards or anything like that. So it's big. It's a huge, it's very huge now. You find Buddhist communities in almost every prison. Okay, so the group that you are talking to right now, it's the 2021 Black Buddhist Conference. It's yes. sponsored by Shambhala who is the publisher of your book, Finding Freedom, which just got re-released. And they'd like you to talk specifically to how Buddhism plays an important role in the lives of a lot of the black Americans who have been incarcerated or who are there now. You know, and, and what I know, my own experience, is, and it's all been in San Quentin, and it's mostly all been on death row, so I don't have a lot of what this panel might have as their own experiences. But for me, I think Buddhism and... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. The relationship to being black and a Buddhist or being black and a teacher is, is territorial. I've never, ever saw a teacher of African descent teaching Buddhism in prison. It is unheard of in my own experience. But, you know, I'm isolated. You know, I'm in, I'm on death row and I'm isolated. The condemn units in San Quentin's death row are very isolated. The panel that this is being presented to, they are both black Buddhist practitioners, but also non-practitioners. So people who maybe identify with Islam or maybe identify with Christianity. Can Buddhism or practices therein add to their own religious practices? I think so. I don't see why not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know all the tenets of these various faiths, but I can't imagine someone saying that I need to cultivate compassion. I need to be of some service to to quell violence wherever I am. I, I shouldn't have a problem understanding the nature of suffering and where that leads, you know, I, I, I can't imagine those various tenets not playing a part in all faiths, mm -hmm. you know. But if you get hooked on the name, you leave a lot of people behind no matter what faith you're in. Yeah, the name is a hook to me, you know, and I started using that phrase when I was talking to you earlier about killing the Buddha. Mm -hmm. the, the name Buddha is a hook. It creates confusion you know, and it creates chaos and it denounces, you know, this truth. To me, it feels like when you use these terms, you're using something against people attraction. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Martin Luther King walked with all face. And I didn't see no problem with that, you know, and no one's seen a problem with that. Probably the FBI did, but no one else, <laughs> you know. And, mm -hmm. and, but we can walk together, you know, we can sit together, you know, we can use our own particular practices to make the world better, you know, to end mm -hmm. the suffering of all being. You know, that's, yeah. that's perfect to me. And, you know, I was raised in a Baptist church when I was small. So yeah. um, I tried my best to get out of that place mm -hmm. um, because I was young and I just, you know, I, 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 like any kid back in the, you know, back then, way back then, you know, you rather ride your bike, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know, you rather play marbles or something, you know. <laughs> Getting all dressed up and they putting all that grease on your face and you sitting 
sitting with all these old people and somebody, <laughs> somebody it's some you see a every time you walk in this church you see a casket sitting right down the aisle. I didn't want that. That was not yeah. my bike, you know, or my right. my skateboard. Yeah. Yeah. So So we talked about your book Finding Freedom being re re released this past year and then David Chef's book, The Biography, The Buddhist on Death Row was released several months ago. It's such a beautiful book. And then the new anthology, Black and Buddhist. So how does it feel for you to see growing interest in the experience of Black Buddhists around the country? I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I remember a while back, sort of when I was still in an angry state, and I said, you know what? It's, you know, I went to my teacher, I went to Lisa, one of the senior students of Repoche, and I said, you know what, why isn't there black Buddhists, you know? How can all these people be reincarnated as Asian, you know, Tibetan? How's that true? That don't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. You know, you mean to tell me everybody who has something that created a, a recycle of life, as we would call it, a rebirth, they all end up being Tibetan or Chinese or Japanese or Asian. How, how does that happen? What do you guys get that from? You mm -hmm. know, that don't make, that don't jive with me. And, I, and for me, I used to just come straight out with it, you know. Um, yeah. And, and she said to me, she said, and I'll never forget it. She said, Martin Luther King was a Buddhist. Malcolm X was a Buddhist. This is where you find your teachers. Your teachers are not, to, you know, always Tibetan. They are the community leaders in your community. They are the black teachers who teaches kids. They are there. They yeah. just don't get hooked up on the name Buddhist. You hear Buddhist because that's their name and that's their faith, you know, in Asia or somewhere else. But Trust me, they're there, and they're mm -hmm. practicing, and they're teaching, and that just that was a life-changing moment for me. You have 60 seconds remaining. Because I needed to hear that answer. Yeah. If I had not known that answer, I would always have hiccups about what's going on with this, you know. Yeah. So to go back to what you were saying, I, I think it's a good thing. I, I really do. Yeah. Well, you know, the folks at Shambhala and the summit's host, Ayo Yatunde, mm -hmm. wanted to express their gratitude because this is awesome. It's going to be an amazing event and uh, wish you could be there physically, but maybe next year, maybe 2022, we'll have you keynote <laughs> the event yeah. and, and physically hey, be know, there. What I do you can, say? That would be great. That would be great. But if I can ask them for a favor, you know, uh -huh. I would say to them, if it's all possible, I would love for that panel to bring as much of what they're speaking to inside San Quentin. I think that would be a very powerful statement. Mm -hmm. I mean, San Quentin has two cable stations that are specifically used to address or to speak out of other places that inmates may not be allowed to go or yep. not have privy to have access you know if you are in isolation confinement they they have church services on that station uh if you're in education and you can't get to a you know a school a, you know the prison schoolhouse they run school via television the cable station and to have this african community of buddhists and non-buddhists appear on those stations would say a whole lot yep. to the benefit. That is a huge step. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And well, I'll work with them. I'll do what I can do to help help facilitate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That would be great. Okay. Um, you got it. You done did good. And I ain't blowing smoke. No, I ain't so tickled. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right.
This call right. and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Boy, oh, he's telling me I have to go now. Okay. So, all right. Hey, so take care. <laughs>